It was a very strange sort of schizophrenic season for all of us. Season four was about your freshman year of college. It was about the freedom and the terror and the sort of search for identity. It's very liberating, it's very fun, and at the same time, you can make a lot of really dumb mistakes and you can lose touch with important things, which all of them sort of did. And the idea was that by the end of the season, they would have come back and said, wow, we all went on this journey. None of us went together, but here we all are. The whole world in front of her, and she comes back to this dive. Xander! Buffy in particular finds herself kind of adrift, and that's why when we see her at school, she's really small in comparison to all the big buildings. We wanted to really convey her sense of insignificance compared to this big experience. We thought a lot about the fact that even though she's the Slayer, this isn't a situation that a Slayer necessarily has the skills to take on. What if I can't cut it? Can't cut what? Slaying? Slaying everything. Buffy gets beat up by a girl, which never happens. She just meets a tougher girl who lives on campus. Her name is Sunday, and really gave Buffy a run for her money. Some people objected to the fact that she was so meek at the beginning of The Freshman, but that was our whole point. The character of the Slayer is only interesting when she is also human and when she also has human emotions and, and frailties. Buffy is also feeling small and kind of insignificant as she sort of lost her security blanket. And we sort of, that's how we dealt with the missing angel, was this just general sense of nothing's quite right. Rupert, you have a guest. Buffy, hello. Is this a bad time? <laughs> I'm a lost soul at the time. A bit of a lounge lizard hanging out with my girlfriend, Olivia. He purposefully cuts himself adrift uh, from Buffy and says, um, you know, pff, you're, a, you're a big girl now, you're at university, go off and, and do your thing. Remember before you became Hugh Hefner when you used to be a watcher? Officially, you no longer have a watcher. Buffy, you are going to have to take care of yourself. As the season goes on, it becomes more and more evident that now that I'm cut loose, um, I don't know what to do with myself, and so we have little visits to Charles's home where he started to watch quiz shows and he's obviously becoming unhinged. Everybody, Giles has a TV. He's shallow like us. Harsh Light of Day is an episode which Buffy is rebounding from Angel and she ends up sleeping with Parker. And so you're sort of set up to believe Parker is probably evil, or perhaps that he's going to be the new love interest for the season, that he's going to be what eventually turned out to be Riley. Um, but he's not evil and he's not Riley. He's, just, he's a guy that doesn't call back. At the same time that Buffy's going through that, Spike is back in town. It isn't time yet. Yeah, but as soon as we have the Gem of Amara, you're gonna be so, so The Ring of Amara is what we call the phlebotanum for this episode, the sort of magical element, the supernatural element of the story. A mystical artifact that allows vampires to go out in sunlight. What are you doing, you big freak? That's my gem. Spike gets that gem, and then you have a big old fight with him and Buffy out in the sunlight. Just when Buffy's been hit emotionally by Parker leaving, Spike comes along, broad daylight can knock the crap out of her. So, you let Parker take a poke, eh? Did you play the sensitive lad and get you to seduce him? At the end of this episode, Buffy is walking along with Willow. God, I'm just a fool. What she originally said was, I kept telling myself, look how much I'm over Angel. Look how I'm not even thinking about Angel. Look how I'm going out with this other guy and it's not about Angel. I should have realized that meant it was all about Angel. And we cut that line because the episode was something like six minutes too long and we cut a lot of stuff. Um, and it's a shame because a lot of people felt that Buffy was very disrespectful to Angel and the memory of what they'd had to sleep with this guy so soon. About you know, what happened to him. When I said I was over you, I mean, I really... Anya. I don't have time. There's actually a third story in Harsh Light of Day. There's the Spike Harmony story, the Buffy Parker story, and an Anya Zander story. So that the episode ends with our sort of three abandoned women all walking through campus at the same time. This was the episode where Anya comes back and asks Xander to sleep with her. I like you. You're funny and you're nicely shaped. And frankly, it's ludicrous to have these interlocking bodies and not interlock. 
she seduces Xander in a very peculiar and ex demony kind of way. And then after it's over, she thinks he's going to be out of her system, but in fact... So I, I'm over you now. She reacts as uh, human people do. I'm only a wolf three nights a month. Or you're the wolf all the time, and this human face is just your disguise. You ever think about that, Oz? The way Oz and Veruca deal with being wolves is on the same theme of repressing the id. It's a, such a strong metaphor, and it's no secret that horror films and like werewolf stories and many, many, um, you know, cliches of the horror genre are all about sexuality and kind of the, the feeling of having to sort of keep that repressed and when it comes out, it's a, it's a beast, it's a monster. Wild at Heart is the same kind of idea taken to the next level, which is Oz meets a woman who's the same as he is, who has that beast at the core of her being. And there's an attraction there which is beyond rational thought. And when it comes out, it really destroys everything around them. And Oz is aware of that and is trying to keep it contained because he doesn't want to hurt the people he loves. You know, anyone in real life who just lives by their desires is going to cause wreckage. She is the example of someone who's just given into it completely. She's given into that side of her nature. And Oz is the civilized man. He's the person trying to keep all that in check. Situation? Gentlemen, suit up. We have a code red. Hostel 17 has escaped. It's a big turning point when we find out that the government and that science, that basically the world of science, has invaded this world of magic. And this is the first time that we see that Riley, he's not only a part of it, but he's a squad leader, and that there's this enormous operation going on underneath the campus of UC Sunnydale. And there is one scene that I really like that's very much in the vein of 30s screwball romantic comedies where they meet on a park bench and they're talking and they both have to go because action is broken out. And it's kind of like they're both Clark Kent dealing with it. You know, I gotta go to my phone booth now and change into my superhero garb and hiding that from one another. Is there something out there? Huh? We see Angel for the first time crossing over from his own show in Pangs. Angel has returned to town because he's received warning that Buffy might be in danger. But he doesn't want to get into the emotional situation of letting Buffy know that he's there. He is unseen by Buffy. It's a crossover that Buffy is unaware of. Help me. Oh. What part of help me do you not understand? Come on, a, a pot boiling out here. Spike is in terrible shape in Pangs. He's got his chip. He hasn't really learned how to deal with it yet. All he knows is that he can't feed. He is one of the ones with the sort of pangs of longing. We see him looking through the window at a sort of a happy vampire nest that's uh, all eating a victim together. The longing that Buffy has for this Thanksgiving dinner, Spike has it too. He wants a lot of blood in his, but it's the same kind of longing. Spike's more important than me. I get it. Well, fine. Why doesn't you just go marry him? From now on, we're family. When Oz left Willow, Obviously, it devastated her. And she's not willing to let the grief run its course because it's just so painful for her. So she decides she's going to do something about it to stop her pain. And the spell that she cast was to have her will done. Her hope for it was that she could say, I want my pain to be over now. Unfortunately, that didn't work. And whatever she said would literally come true. <laughs> Damn. Giles is turned into a demon and it's about him scrambling through the world and no one recognizing him and everything being very alien to him at a time when Giles is in fact alienated. He begins to think that no one understands him or really cares about him. So um, the whole idea behind New Man is that, you know, what is it like if you feel completely cut off from a group and you feel like you're talking and no one understands you? So what's the extension of that in Joss Whedon's mind? Make Joss a demon who goes, <laughs> He thinks he's talking normally, but everyone hears guttural, fjarl demon. D don't you understand me? 
The spell is put on Giles by his old friend Ethan Rain, a character that we'd introduced before. He was in the very first Buffy Halloween episode. He's an old friend with Giles from when they were teenagers. They had done some very bad magic together that had actually resulted in a death that um, made Giles recoil from, from magic, particularly dark magics. Um, but Ethan worships chaos, and he has stayed on the sort of dark path. This is your objective, sub T67119. Demon class, Bulgara species. Bone skewers jut from the creature's forearms during battle. It's imperative when ensnaring it not to damage its arms. Question. Why exactly can't we damage this poke thing's arms? Now that the Inisham knows about Buffy, Buffy tries to work with him and become a member of the Commandos. And she thinks, well, this is great. This is, I'm working with my boyfriend. Eventually, it comes down to the Inisham deciding that the Slayer is dangerous to them. And Professor Walsh takes it upon herself to try to eliminate her. I think we've got a situation. The Slayer? She's becoming a liability. We knew that was a danger. We moved to the contingency scenario. The leaders of the initiative, including Professor Walsh, they're never questioned about their orders. And Buffy is not someone who will not question. She is someone who is eternally seeking, you know, she wants to know what is up at all times. And it allows us for Professor Walsh to reveal her true colors, which is, in fact, she's, she's far more evil, and the initiative is involved with much darker things than they've let on. If she wants a fight, we'll give her one. Won't we, Adam? I've worked too long. A project she's been working on for some time awakens, and this is Adam. Adam is a part cybernetic, part human, part demon hybrid that the military and the initiative has been working on. And Adam rises up and introduces himself basically as the threat of the rest of the season. She said that you and I were her favorite children, her art. That makes us brothers, family. No, I'm not like you. It was always our intention for Riley to find out that the initiative was not a good thing because he was a really decent person. It had to be what it was, which was shock and denial, and eventually realizing that he had to continue being a hero. But he, he loses it in great part in Goodbye Iowa because he's um, withdrawing from all the chemicals they've had them on to sort of make them superheroes. So he's really going through drug withdrawal, which is why he becomes kind of irrational and has these temper flares and stuff like that. You told me you were tracking the Bogara demon. I thought I'd help. But now I see you're not hunting demons, you're socializing with them, again. Riley's loss of innocence, you know, was an expansion of the theme of college being this place where your mind is expanded. Sometimes the beliefs you have and the things that you hold dear, when you come in, when you come out, you have a whole different perspective on the world. Are you all right? Five by five. That's the thing about a coma. You wake up all rested and rejuvenated and ready for payback. At the end of season three, Buffy and Faith got into an epic battle where Faith got knocked into a coma. And Faith has been in that coma ever since. This is the episode where Faith wakes up. The thing that slingshots Faith back to reality and back to the world of the living is she's plagued by dreams. And my interpretation of that was that even though her brain was knocked into unconsciousness, there was some small part of her that just lived the events over and over and over. And what was great about this episode is we got an opportunity to get inside Faith's brain. And we see Buffy from Faith's perspective. And Buffy is a monster to Faith. They share a certain like-mindedness. At the end of season three, Faith showed up in Buffy's dreams. Buffy is the only person who can really understand Faith's pain because she is also a vampire slayer and she is also isolated from the world and alone and lonely. So I think Buffy feels a great deal of guilt and responsibility towards her younger sister. Buffy is sympathetic to Faith because she is responsible for putting her in a coma. Are you ever gonna take this thing out? It's the desire for revenge that woke her up. Faith wakes up, she escapes, and then she is lost on the streets of Sunnydale, which I really like. So much has changed, and Faith hasn't been a part of it, and she's kind of catching up to the world around her. They have one of the biggest knockdown drag out fights where they just trash the house. We'll never know for sure if they just fought and Faith lost, or if Faith let Buffy 
beat her into near unconsciousness so that Faith as Buffy could just deliver one knockout punch. No! I mean, no! Give me a sedative now. Hold her. I have to go home. She's with my mother. No! Just lie still. You don't understand. Keep holding her. She's taking my, my body. What I was really interested in was seeing the character of somebody who's hated and considers the world her enemy, getting the chance to completely destroy the life of somebody who's got everything she doesn't have and represents everything she doesn't believe, and having it affect her instead so that she has no understanding of, of what she means. And we did that specifically with the line that she says three times. You can't do that. It's wrong. I'll kick your ass. Because it's wrong. <laughs> You are not going to kill these people because it's wrong. By the end of the show, she says it with all sincerity. She's become Buffy. She wants more than anything in the world to be Buffy, which is just impossible for her. She realizes that she hates what she is more than anybody else. I am not a killer. I am the Slayer. Faith is definitely Buffy's shadow self. You know, she's her dark side. But it's also about what love does to you. Buffy was raised with love. She was raised in a loving family. She has friends. You know, Faith is really shaken by the experience of feeling love. This possibility of a whole different life. Like, what would it feel like if you didn't live in this sort of lonely, um, isolated existence? And if you did actually relate to other people and they saw you differently? But what her response to that is to get very self-destructive. Faith has won a fabulous trip to England, and I got the consolation prize, which is you. So I don't have to worry about Faith showing up. A lot of people were surprised that Riley actually slept with her. Even though he sort of senses something's up with her emotionally, of course, he's not going to get that it's not her. And the fact that he slept with her is just, you know, it seems so un riley because he's so the noble guy, but let's face it, you know, he's just a guy, and it, it really throws something up between him and Buffy, which is, which is good and harsh. She's not your friend. I may have overestimated the you-liking her factor. I, I don't think she's her. This was actually a kind of a pivotal episode for them because we had played witchcraft as a metaphor for sex, their relationship as a metaphor for a romantic relationship that you don't feel comfortable telling people about. I am, you know, but yours. Meaning, you know, we have something more than just a friendship that was very specific. And then, of course, we shot one of the steamiest sex scenes that we've ever shot, which was designed specifically to be their first sex scene. They built the relationship as a relationship first and then as a sexual kind of thing later. It's really, it's an extension of the relationship, of their personalities, you know, Willow becoming more and more involved in the witchcraft and Tara being kind of nervous about that because, I mean, you, you see that in real relationships, you know, someone getting more aggressive and more, you know, edgy with, with the way they live their lives and the other person kind of being, hey, we need to be more down to earth. Hi. We have a problem. Sounds like you could use my help. When the show opens, Jonathan is the biggest star in the world and it is not explained to the audience. They recut the opening credits, so it's a series of shots of Jonathan being Jonathan-esque in his superhero way. And the audience isn't given any hint of what is going on. This episode started when the spell was already in effect because it put the audience in a, an off-center place where the audience got to figure out what was going on. Many people were very confused when this episode aired. They felt they'd missed something. Jonathan is a character played by Danny Strong who we had seen in a number of earlier episodes. You delved into the black arts and conjured up a hell beast from the ocean's depths to wreak your vengeance. No. I snuck in yesterday and peed in the pool. Jonathan had a large role in an episode I wrote called Earshot, in which we saw him up in the Sunnydale High clock tower with a gun. And Buffy talks to him at that point about, you can't solve everything all at once with some big gesture. And what we see in Superstar is that he has not learned his lesson. He, once more, he's tried to solve everything with a big gesture. And it's basically so he can have friends. And he creates this monster 
by turning himself into the biggest star in the world, and he feels really bad about the monster. You know, he's worried about the monster and what it's gonna do to people, and, and he doesn't want anyone hurt at all. He just wants people to like him. This does explain everything. I know he wouldn't do anything on purpose. Me too. And that whole alternate universe thing was too freaky. <laughs> This is just a standalone episode in which everything in this universe is not true in the episodes both before and after it. But we still have Jonathan moving the story arc for the season along. He talks to both Buffy and Riley separately about their relationship to each other and allows them to heal the rift between them that happens because of faith. And he discovers and informs people about a very important feature of our villain, Adam, which we, in a fact, we end up using later on when Buffy defeats Adam. Look at the sky. Full moon. Full moon. But how? Because of Willow's relationship with Tara, that there was a lot unresolved between Oz and Willow. And then it just didn't feel like they'd had closure. There's something undeniable between her and, and Oz that won't ever go away. They just have a, a connection. Time had passed, and people expected them to get back on the bus. And when they didn't, there was reasons, of course, and yet no one really understood why Willow would have any hesitation. Their breakup was about necessity. It was about a condition he had. It's almost as if someone went away with a disease. You know, I'm going to go find the cure. And he came back saying, I found the cure. So everyone expected them to just resume and Tara and Willow's relationship is actually getting deeper and more solid. And then Oz comes back and Willow finds herself really torn. She tries to kind of pretend like that's not there and instead sort of really alienates Tara. And Tara, of course, gets extremely threatened. It's the classic love triangle. There's part of you that really wants her to go back to Oz and part of you that really wants her to stay with Tara. So I think the audience was definitely getting to go through that experience of feeling really conflicted. And ultimately, what turns out is that Oz's solution hasn't really uh, solved everything. And the beast that comes out again is just as uncontrollable as it was before. Run. The one thing that sets Oz off in New Moon Rising is when he finds out that uh, Willow and Tara are lovers. And there was a lot of uh, debate about that. Like, are we saying that that would bring out, you know, something evil in somebody? And ultimately, you know, for me personally, my feeling was, yeah, yeah, it would bring out, you know, um, the worst in people as well as the best in people. So even though he's a good man, that part of him, the reaction, not the rational thought, that's the monster, and it was going to come back out. I don't need a bunch of tests to know that this thing's a joke. Riley's first reaction to saving Oz is that Oz is a beast, you know, Oz is a werewolf. Riley's been working on the assumption that anything that looks a certain way is bad. There's a desire to make things very black and white. I mean, a lot of what this season was about is the desire to have a worldview that is simplistic because then you know what right and wrong is and there's no gray. That living in the gray area is really uncomfortable. So Riley learns again about the gray area and the whole idea of Riley's character was that he was gonna be a person who's very um, clear about his worldview and that that was just gonna continually get messed with. And he needs to understand that just like Angel and other people in their universe, not all things that appear to be beasts are fully evil. Spike, I want you to come with me. You're going to help me with my problem. Why is that exactly? I'm going to help you with yours. Spike knew that the biggest big bad was going to be Adam and that when the dust settled, Adam was going to still be standing, or so he thought. Adam recruited Spike because he knew that Spike could help him get inside the Slayer's world. Controlling the HSTs is getting harder. We have serious overcrowding in the containment areas. Quite a mess. It's not my mess, sir. I'm just holding the fort while you figure out what you want to do with the place. Season four is definitely about science versus magic. We've always been in Buffy's world where magic rules, and Buffy herself is a byproduct of magic. So we threw in a bigger, and less successful picture of what happens when the United States government gets involved, what happens when people who believe in science and kind of have disdain for demons want to capture them and use them for military gain, and what happens when science tries to control the world of magic is science gets its ass roundly kicked uh, by magic. Magic is just too powerful in Buffy's world. 
Where do you think you're going? I want to see an old girlfriend. Oh, you really think I'm going to let that happen? Think you're going to stop me? I surely do. When Angel and Riley meet, what's fun is that neither guy is going to blink. And I think that Buffy is really torn between the two of them. And even the writers were kind of torn between the two of them as we were going. There were definitely Angel groups and Riley groups. And who gets the last word and who gets the last punch. And there was a lot of back and forth on that. Um, and what we ultimately came to that was fairest to everybody was that Riley couldn't really win the fight because Angel is too strong. But what's great about Riley is that he's the guy who won't stop coming. You know, he just keeps coming after Angel, even though he knows he can't beat him in a straight up fight. Once you forget your old life and embrace your destiny as I have, you will know power you've never dreamed of. I think you're going to like it. Riley also has a chip in him that the initiative had put inside him, a homing chip that brought him to Adam. We learn that Riley, when he ever got killed in battle or severely injured in battle, dealing with his demons, Professor Walsh was readily prepared to turn him into another Adam. When, as he learns more and more about the initiative and learns more and more of the darkness of their purpose, it causes his world to crumble around him. It becomes a darker character. Seeing his mother figure, his mentor, Professor Walsh, turned into a mindless zombie, as well as Dr. Engelman. More and more, he's coming to realize that his life for the last couple of years, his training was all a big lie. It was all, it was all for nothing. It was for something that is against everything he believes in. I activated his chip. So it's chips all around, is it? Someone must have bought the party pack. You get yours removed when the Slayer is where I want her. Spike, in the prior episode, had splintered the group. Yet, part of the plan that he was working with Adam was, I'm going to get the group a disc that will lead the Slayer down there so I can kill her. But if the only person who can read that disc is Willow, uh, and Willow's not talking to Buffy, then how is Buffy going to get the information? Actually, Adam recognizes it, and, and Spike suddenly goes, uh-oh, I screwed up. I split them up, and yet I gave them a disc. But in the episode, essentially, the group decides they need to put aside their differences. S Spike can be very convincing when... when, when uh... But he played us. He wanted us to fight to split us up. Primeval is about rebuilding trust and that whole relationship of the original four. And that's why you don't see Tara in it very much and you don't see Anya in it very much. It's, it's really the main four characters who started the series together, building this unity back, building their trust, realizing that Spike has, has used all of them and deceived all of them. It's must-see TV. Bait's been taken, trap's all set, Slayer has landed. When Buffy goes into the initiative and they go in with a spell, it's a spell that not only is mystical and spiritual, but is one in which it, it bonds the core group of our characters. They become one force. And so in, in the same way that we bring our characters back together physically, they make up, they, you know, we lie, I love you, and you're my best friend. We also say they are also part of a big whole. You know, they're all parts of this one big powerful Force. It was partially inspired by uh, an Alan Moore comic book. As Justin were breaking it, he referred to Promethea. There's an Alan Moore comic book which uh, deals with a very uh, mystical superheroine. You can't last much longer. We can. We are forever. Interesting. I'm a Shandab. The concept and story that The Matrix told visually changed the way we wanted to see uh, film. Much of these ideas kind of rooted in a, in a comic book world that, you know, Joss is a, very much a fan of. And this was like an exciting moment for us because it actually kind of put it out there that we could do different things uh, in the motion picture medium uh, that were being done and done well in the comic book world. We're not demons. Is that a fact? What was yours? Before Adam? Restless was a deliberate attempt, and it threw a lot of people to do a very different season finale. Twice we had done two-part giant battle um, extravaganzas. We'd done Becoming Part 1 and 2, and then we'd done Graduation Day Part 1 and 2. And when we did the final resolution of the initiative, we had already done that exact thing. Big start and then a 
huge finish with a giant battle. And we didn't want to be repeating ourselves. And quite frankly, the initiative was not the emotional center of the lives of our kids. Ultimately, it was just a place for a big fight, and we had some cool stuff, and it was fun, but I was like, I wanna try something different. I'd like to do the big finale, and then I'd like to have an episode that's all just a grace note. And I thought of the dream episode, and I thought this would be a really nice, interesting way to really comment on where we've come and who we are. And the entire episode is basically just four character studies. What these people are about, what they fear, what they want, well, who they are. Oh my God, the place is packed. Everybody's here. Your whole family's in the front row and they look really angry. There's a production. The most important thing when I first started it was that the dreams be dreamlike. Originally I was thinking of the way dreams transition, the way things are not what they are, the way you respond differently, the way you go from place to place and, and they connect in ways they shouldn't. It's about combining the totally surreal with the totally mundane. And I think that actually worked out very well. I got the primitive, this creepy figure that's going from dream to dream, so there is some connective tissue. It then became a question of basically writing poetry. Um, basically free associating. Obviously things had to get worse at the end of each act. People had to be in peril because this thing was trying to kill them in their dreams. But beyond that, there really was no structure. So I was basically sitting down to write a 40 minute tone poem. Now I don't write poetry because I'm very literal minded and it was extremely liberating and strange and another big, oh my God, I'm gonna fail, they're gonna hate me, um, experience to just kind of free associate on these characters and how I feel about them and what's cool about them. I have no speech, no name. I live in the action of death, the blood cry, the penetrating wound. I am destruction, absolute, alone. The Slayer. The first. I introduced the idea of the primitive because I wanted um, somewhat to set up uh, the coming year. I wanted to set up the idea of what it means to be a slayer and, and, and I wanted to talk in terms of the year that had gone before Buffy's ideas about everything she'd felt and seen and how she reacted to them and the difference between her and other slayers, you know, was basically that she had these people and we had separated her from these people for part of the season and so for her to be back with them and to be saying, you know what, I'm not this primal, alone, demon-like creature was important, but I also wanted to set up the question in her mind, what is it, you know, what is my history, what is a slayer? What is that all about for season five? I very much feel this episode gave resolve to the season in the sense that, you know, it summed up, you know, where our characters were and that ultimately they needed each other even if their relationships with each other were a bit bizarre. It was sort of a chaotic season. And a lot of people say it's the season where we fell apart and they don't like it. I actually think it's the season where we did most of our best shows. But it did sort of have a weird incoherence. As I was talking about the initiative and other things, you know, a lot of things didn't come together in the big picture. Episode by episode, I mean, the strength was pretty much unmatched. But as an arc, I understand why people are sort of like, well, it didn't really get me there. So this episode, in a way, is a way of saying, just look at the pieces, look at the characters and what they've been through. Mm -hmm.